Dr. Bala, we can begin now. Yeah, sorry. Namaste. Today's, uh, today's distinguished speaker, Professor Lavanya Vamsani, Department from Department of Political Science, Shawn State University. Dr. Geetesh Nirvan, co candidate of the webinar series that we, uh, that we have been organizing. Distinguished invitees, dear friends interested in Mahabharata scholarship. I welcome you all to this 38th session of the series of webinars on Mahabharata as hosted by Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, Kamala Nehru College, University of Delhi. Uh, we are all in one way or the other affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. I hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe during these uncertain times. Now we understand that the world is slowly opening up. Okay, we are no more uh, so concerned and worried about, concerned definitely, but not worried about uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we need to divert ourselves from the news and statistics. And also we need to focus on ourselves as to how do we look at, you know, how do we understand the self. So in the process of uh, encouraging people to get into their own selves and understand them, we thought this, we started this webinar series and we thought by looking at and looking at the scholarship that has come on Mahabharata uh, all through uh, these years would help us to have a relook at our tradition and our own selves as well. With that intention, uh, we have started this webinar series. And these webinars are being organized under the aegis of a SPARC project, which is a scheme for promotion of academic and research collaboration, an initiative uh, by Ministry of Education, Government of India. Uh, the title of the project that we have uh, uh, that we have got and working on is Yoga Consciousness in Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita: An Ethical Value for Societal and Political Well-Being. We are working as a team for this project, along with uh, Professor Vishwa Adluri from Hunter College, City University of New York, Dr. Joydeep Bakshi from Germany, who is presently associated with uh, Hindu University of uh, America as co-investigator, and Dr. Geetesh Nirban, who is presently hosting this webinar from Department of Philosophy, Kamala Nehru College, and me, Professor Bala, uh, uh, from Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, uh, as the uh, principal investigator from India. Our extended team consists of Ms. Jayshri Jha, Ms. Anmol Preet Kaur, uh, who are research associates of the project, and Ms. Megha Kapoor and Ms. Deepshika, who are the students of the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi. Something that is interesting is all three of them are working on uh, various themes related to Mahabharata for their doctoral work. And Deepshika, of course, is doing her master's program and she is also interested in uh, Mahabharata scholarship. The project that we have uh, taken up, uh, with, uh, we have taken it up with certain objectives. One of them is to build a new approach to yoga that combines theoretical and practical perspectives together. And we also aim to understand yoga as an overarching term for salvic practices and to see how it is embedded in social and political reality, which was not done before. So this, this was one of our major concerns. And along with that, we also tried to demonstrate how answers to the question of right action at societal and political levels can be explored through the conception of yoga consciousness in Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita that transcends sectarian and doctrinal boundaries to create a global system of thought and practice. And we also try to look at the text Mahabharata to explicate the universal philanthropic and humanitarian aspects of Hinduism uh, that are recorded in the text. So these are some of the concerns that we have, uh, the aims and objectives that we have with which we have started this project. And our attempt is not to just uh, explore various aspects of Mahabharata uh, at the academic level alone, but also to reach the diverse audience. And that is how uh, we, are, uh, uh, we have started this series of webinars, uh, which is our humble attempt to make the various aspects of Mahabharata reach the diverse audience who hold interest in the study of the epic. We started this series of webinars during the extreme phase of lockdown to engage minds with Mahabharata 
and we have had the privilege of hosting scholars of repute from universities and organizations in India and abroad, wherein diverse topics related to Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita have been touched, ranging from social and political well-being, ethical dilemmas, justice, consciousness, karma yoga, instrumental violence, humanness in punishment, and many other aspects, no? many more topics pertaining to this epic, all as an attempt to explore Mahabharata for the human well-being. And we are really honored to have with us today Professor Lavanya, uh, who is presently Professor of History at Department of, uh, Department of Social Sciences, Shawn State University, USA. Uh, she would be uh, speaking today this evening uh, on Savitri, the Timeless Traveler. So without wasting much time, I uh, request Dr. Geetesh to introduce uh, Dr. Lavanya formally uh, so that we can go further uh, in this talk. Over to you, Dr. Geetesh. Thank you, Professor Bala. Namaskar and welcome you all to the 38th session of the ongoing series of the Spark webinars. We've had the honor to host scholars from around the globe in this ongoing series of exploring Mahabharat from varied perspectives as Professor Bala just shared with all of us. It's a moment of joy to have amongst us today, Dr. Lavanya Vemseni, who has significant research work to her credit. Dr. Lavanya Vemseni is an award-winning scholar and distinguished professor of history in the Department of Social Sciences at Shawnee State University. Dr. Vemsani is also the honorary visiting professor in the School of Historical Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She is a Fulbright Fellow for 2021-22. Her research and teaching interests are interdisciplinary and multifold. She researches and publishes on subjects of ancient history and religions, as well as the current history of India. Dr. Vemsani's books include, to name few of them, Feminine Journey of the Mahabharat, Hindu Women in History, Text and Practice. Another one, Hindu and Jaina Mythology of Balaram, Krishna in History, Thought and Culture, an Encyclopedia of the Lord of Many Names, Hinduism in Text and Context. And of course, she has to her credit number of articles on history and religions of India. Her upcoming books include Hinduism in Middle India, Narsimha, The Lord of the Middle, India, A New History. She is also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Indic Religion 2020 to 23 period. And she's an associate editor of the Canadian Journal of History and the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. With so much of prolific writing and research to her credit, we feel so happy to host you today on the Spark webinar platform, Professor Lavanya. Welcome. Welcome to the Indian platform of University of Delhi here under the edges of the Spark project. Professor Lavanya has agreed to deliver an address as Professor Bala just mentioned on a very interesting topic, Savitri, the timeless traveler. Here we welcome you, Professor Lavanya, and I invite you to share with all of us, your thoughts on Savitri. Over to you, Professor Lavanya. Namaste. Uh, namaste, uh, Gitesh ji, and uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me, and thank you, Professor Bala, Bala uh, for uh, thinking about me and uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm really happy to join you all. Uh, and uh, uh, deliver this lecture on Savitri. Savitri is very uh, important, uh, feminine, divine, and feminine heroic uh, in um, Indian studies, Hindu studies, Mahabharata studies, very, very uh, important. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and I'll start. Uh, and thank you uh, very much for having me here. I'm opening my notes. Uh, Uh, so uh, the journey of Savitri uh, is unique and unparalleled in the history of classics of India as well as the world. 
for recollecting an inconceivable journey of a female trailblazer of womanly leadership. The fate of literary studies is such that the heroic journey of a man venturing out into danger for the perceived success and benefits of obtaining the hand of a beautiful maiden along with bountiful wealth as well as part of a kingdom is praised and admired, while that of a woman as described in Savitri's journey to the other world with a similar premise is relegated to the background. In the world of literature, there abound myriads of male heroes venturing into the unknown dangerous world to return to win a beautiful wife, wealth, and kingdom. However, in the tale of Savitri, born in the place of his son, the feminine heroic ventures into the unknown woods, first to choose her groom, and her next journey into the world of death, following Yama, the lord of death, ultimately winning her husband and kingdom back. Savitri does this in her feminine, unassuming style, utilizing her presence of mind and strong character rather than physical strength. She stood the ultimate test of life and death to prove that she is the winner. So this is her journey, her timeless journey. Traveling into the world of death is traveling beyond time and physical uh, regularities. So Savitri's journey depicts the lone female traveler of the woods transformed into a traveler of the other worlds. Among the myriads of feminine journeys available in the world of classical stories, Savitri is the only female to have traveled to the woods to choose her husband, braced for the wedding, even upon learning the news of his impending death, eventually facing and winning over none other than the death, the god, of y the god Yama. Each stage of her journey is unique. I divide the journey of her life into five stages for convenience of analysis. The first stage is her birth as a blessed child. The second stage is her quest for suitable groom. The third stage is Savitri's preparation for her solemn journey. In the fourth stage of her life, Savitri ventures into the other world following Yama. Stage five marks her return to the earth, successfully rescuing her husband from death and finally returning to her kingdom with the family to reign as a queen. The heroism of Savitri goes missing from the discussion as she is seen either as a loyal wife or a strong heroine. Part of the issue also stems from the way the story is framed within the Mahabharata. The Markandeya, when Markandeya visited the Pandavas during the exile, leading it to be relegated to the stories of obedient wives. Earlier analytical works focused on understanding her as a devoted wife, forgetting her self-determination and willpower as the central pillars of her story, which prodded her on that impossible journey. Savitri's self-determination and willpower are notable in every step of the way from choosing Satyavan as her groom to marrying him and then ultimately rescuing from the clutches of death. In fact, I think it was not, if it was not a woman, but a man who undertook this victorious journey to the world of death and returned alive with a revived partner, wealth and prosperity, he would have definitely become the most famous god on earth. Undoubtedly, hundreds, if not thousands of creative analytical works would have been devoted to analyzing his esoteric journey. It was only Aurobindo Savitri, that brought the deeper meaning of the journey of Savitri out of the devoted wife category in favor of the more esoteric and philosophical meaning. However, Aurobindo's Savitri brings out the most, more than the human feat of Savitri's journey, connecting it to the deeper concepts of the time and mind. As an illustration of his enlightened state of the conscious mind, Aurobindo imagined Savitri's journey as a journey into the deathless state. Arbindyo's symbolic reimagination of Savitri was the closest any literary work had ever come to understanding the true depth of Savitri's journey. Arbindyo presents Savitri's journey as a spirit's journey into the timeless state of higher conscience. 
So I will analyze these five stages and then I will also analyze uh, how uh, Aurobindo understands her journey. So that's what is the timeless journey. The concept comes in, out in Aurobindo's uh, work. Uh, the way Savitri, this is the first stage, birth and early life of Savitri. This is also unusual, very different from anyone else. The way Savitri's birth is narrated makes it clear at the outset that she is born in place of a male child. Savitri's father, King, Ma, King of Madra, known by the name Ashwapati, desirous of obtaining a son, undertook a vow of foregoing every sixth meal while performing 100,000 oblations with the Savitri mantra. King Ashwapati lived with strict austerities for 18 years at the completion of which period, the goddess Savitri appeared to him and asked him to seek his wish. Ashwapati said, he began his asteroids to beget a child and hence requested the goddess that he may beget many sons. However, the goddess Savitri informed him that due to the fate ordained to him through Brahma, she could only bless him with a daughter, advising him that the king should not question the boon. Ashwapati gratefully accepted the boon. The king desired many sons, but instead he got only a daughter, shows the precious nature of Savitri right from her birth. Hence, King Ashwapati accepted the boon and Savitri was born. Uh, in, in respect of Savitri, she is also named Savitri. Uh, the birth of Savitri is special, born in place of sun with the blessings of most important Vedic goddess Savitri. She was also named Savitri. As Princess Savitri grew up into a beautiful maiden, another unique issue ensued as no suitor approached the king seeking to marry Savitri as her radiant beauty kept away, kept them away. Savitri's father, Aswapati, uh, took a great decision at this point. Uh, he appointed trusted counselors to travel with her and advised her, choose whoever you want and uh, let her go on her own journey of quest to choose her own groom. Savitri chose to travel through the forest. In, this is the second stage of her life, uh, Savitri's quest. So Savitri chose to travel through the forest in search of a potential groom visiting hermitages rather than marry one of the princes from among the princes in her nearby kingdoms. The fact that Savitri began her search in the forest shows that Savitri placed value in simple life rather than wealth and affluence. Alternatively, Savitri might have also understood the shallow nature of many princes who haven't come forward to propose to her due to her brilliance. She continued her journey, traversing on a chariot. She gradually visited uh, many of the ashramas, visiting sages, donating freely uh, to the chief sage of the ashramas she visited along the way. Uh, was this journey a journey of self-discovery? It certainly seems so. Uh, as represented in Sri Aurobindo's Savitri. Aurobindo uh, clearly brings out the true nature of her journey. So here uh, is a description that Aurobindo's Savitri has uh, for us to understand the deeper meaning of this journey. The world ways opened before Savitri. At first, a strangeness of new brilliant scenes peopled her mind and kept her body's gaze. But as she moved across the changing earth, a deeper conscience welled up in her, a citizen of many scenes and climes, each soil and country it had made its home. It took all clans and peoples up for her own till the whole destiny of mankind was hers. Here is the meaning, the true meaning of conscious. When a yogi realizes the self-conscious, they feel the realization that the whole world is one and one within themselves. So this is presented here in the last two sentences. Till the whole destiny of mankind was hers, it took all clans and people for her own, till the whole destiny of mankind was hers. So it shows that she has attained this enlightened state of mind. Uh, in her quest, she realized herself till the whole destiny of mankind was hers, before met her spiritual match. Savitri's journey is represented here as the quest for realizing higher conscious through spiritual union with Satyavan. So the next stage also shows this higher realization and the union of spirits uh, in Aurobindo Savitri. 
um, this is how Arabindo presents this, uh, as if a blue throated ascetic peered from the stone fastness of his mountain cell. Regarding the brief gladness of the days, his vast extended spirit couched behind. A mighty murmur of immense retreat besieged the ear, a sad and limitless call as a soul retreating from the world. This was the scene in which the ambiguous mother had chosen her brief felicitous, felicitous hour. Here in this solitude, far from the world, her part she began in the world's joy and strife. Here were disclosed to her the mystic courts, the lurking doors of beauty and surprise, the wings that murmur in the golden house, the temple of sweetness, and the fiery isle. So this shows the spiritual gates open for her. Uh, so in the last four sentences have this. As, the, as she traveled through the forts visiting numerous ashramas, she found her groom of choice, Satyavan, living with his visually impaired parents. She returned home as she met him. Uh, she returned home and uh, uh, as she chose Satyavan for her groom, Sri Aurobindo describes the situation as sorrowful roads of time uh, because Satyavan is um, a limited time to live. He doesn't have a long life. So Aravindo also presents that uh, in a deeper meaning. A stranger on the sorrowful roads of time, immortal under the yoke of death and fate, a sacrifice cant of the bliss and pain of the spears, love in the wilderness met Savitri. So she found uh, love, but it's a stranger on the sorrowful roads of time. So as Savitri returned, it so happened that Narada was visiting her father. So hearing that, uh, when she declared the, her choice to her father, hearing that Narada let out a cry of pity uh, and said that uh, the sages with whom they took refuge gave the name Satyavan to the child uh, and his parents lost the kingdom. Uh, in On top of that, his... Uh, uh, his life is not long. Uh, and Narada informs that he was to be uh, dying within a year, exactly within a year. Although concerned, Ashwapati agreed and uh, agreed to marry Savitri to Satyavat. Savitri begins her simple life uh, in the forest with her husband and her parents, uh, her parents-in-law. However, she keeps track of the calendar because the death was impending in a year. Uh, Arvindo explains their relationship as the union of spirits at this point, uh, as here. Uh, out of the vo voiceless mystery of the past, in a present ignorant of forgotten bonds, these spirits met up on the roads of time. He uh, keeps the roads of time again. Yet in the heart of their secret conscious selves, at once aware grew of each other warned by the first call of a delightful voice and a first vision of the destined face. So Savitri is aware of this, Savitri was warned. So the first call of delightful voice, so she knows it's a delightful voice, but she knows what's going to happen. And it's uh, the, the journey begins on the roads of time. The mortal nature of spirits is also noted here. These spirits met up on the roads of time. However, the meeting of spirits is notable here, indicating they are venturing on the advanced path, even though Savitri and Satyavan are depicted in the story as spouses. Uh, scholars have explored this, uh, especially Patrick Beldio uh, further noted and understands this. Uh, spiritual relationship represented here as universal expression of the journey of the soul on the path of higher evolution, reaching Manonasa. Manonasa is the final stage of attainment. Uh, even as these characters demonstrate an example of spiritual concerts that are related to the gurus, uh, it would be incorrect to limit Savitri to the mother and Satyavan to Sri Aurobindo. The, the images are also noted as uh, representing mother and uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo. The goal of the integral yoga is to unite what these characters represent within the devotee, the pure truth of one's innermost being. 
this is what is uh, represented here, that the true uh, self, the innermost self and the attainment of um, the Manonasa. So uh, who is held captive and hidden by the darkness of one's own lower self with the descending light of the supernatural consciousness, the goddess the, of the sun, whose name means stimulator or vivifier. So her name also represents this, this light journey, the, the journey into the light from darkness. Um, so the, the, then we proceed into the third uh, stage of her life. Uh, she married, she found her spiritual union and she also began her journey into light. Um, then she launches into the third uh, part of her life preparations for Savitri's solemn journey. This is the third stage. This is the most difficult stage of her life uh, that she keeps a vow and uh, finds her uh, true path. Uh, Savitri lived the whole year preparing for the fateful day to arrive uh, at the appointed time as indicated by Narada. While living with her husband and parents-in-law, Savitri kept thinking about the fate of her husband and counted each passing day as Narada's words kept running through her mind. Exactly four days prior to that fateful day, Savitri undertook the difficult vow of standing for three nights. Savitri's father-in-law tried to reason with her not to undertake such a severe vow of three nights standing. However, seeing that Savitri is fixed on doing the vow, he gave his blessing. Savitri completed her three night standing vow successfully. Thus Savitri joined him on his purportedly short trip into the forest, fully knowing what is ahead. So the, the, her, she kept the whole year, it's the yogic journey, but her final yogic journey is takes space in the four days where she kept this fast and uh, standing wow. Uh, the yogic um, postures and yogic um, meditative stands and uh, this is well known. Uh, Sri Aurobindo has also kept uh, long uh, vows um, in this uh, style. So uh, this brings us into the fourth part of uh, her life uh, where she ventures into the forest and then uh, she ventures into the other world. So Savitri wanted to go with Satyavan, so uh, that fateful day, uh, because she wanted to be with him uh, to, to protect him. So Savitri reached the forest with Satyavat. In the forest, Satyavat collected fruit and cut firewood. As he worked on chopping the wood, he broke a sweat. Uh, and felt a slight headache. Satyavan came to Savitri and said, I have got a headache from the exertion uh, and my body and heart, see, heart seem to be on fire. Savitri of measured words, uh, I feel uh, I am sick. Uh, my head feels as though it is pierced with spikes. I want to sleep. Uh, taking note of the condition of her husband, Savitri understands uh, that the time has arrived. It almost seems like Savitri anticipated this moment as she fully prepared to face the death. As the god of death appeared, Savitri accosted him and asked him, I know that the what a god for <coughs> thy form is not human. Tell me if it pleases thee, who art thou? God and what does thou seek? So anyway, she asked him, you know, why are you here? Uh, I, I know who you are. And, uh, and uh, of course, Yama answers her because uh, she is already an accomplished yogi at this point. So Yama said, Savitri, you possess the power of austerities. Therefore, I will reply to you, know that I am Yama, God, a uh, oh, oh good woman. The life of your husband, the Prince Satyavat has run out. I shall fetter him and take him along. That is what I seek to do. This is where Savitri's lead is noticed. Uh, this is the only time Yama had acknowledged the power of anyone he met on the earth agreeing to speak. Uh, the Mahabharata describes another event where Yama makes an earthly appearance to meet another woman, but the, his conversation is missing. In the Adi Parva of Mahabharata, Kunti uh, invited Yama upon consultation with her husband uh, Pandu to obtain her first son, uh, Dharmaraja. But uh, we do not have uh, any discussion there. Yama's meeting with Savitri is different. Here he comes 
upon his task facing unexpected opposition. Yama is stopped from his duty by Savitri and obliged to respond to her due to the power of her austerities. This is the beginning of the long and arduous journey of Yama and Savitri. At each step of the way, Yama tried to uh, stop her and urge her to return to the earth, but Savitri persisted. Yama subsequently offered her boons so that she might be satisfied and return to the earth. Yama finally uh, gave four boons to her uh, along with her uh, husband's life. The final boon is a tricky one. Uh, the fourth boon saying, you know, choose you a boon, then you must go. This is where Savitri chooses a boon that binds Yama, enticing him to return the life of Satyavan. As this boon, she chose 100 sons for her uh, with her husband. Yama, without considering it seriously, readily gave her the blessing of 100 sons, which pushed him to give Savitri one more boon as a consequence. Yama relented, but was persuaded by her argument as she said, you have given the boon that a hundred sons will be born to me, yet you take my man. Finally, Yama gave up and said, so be it. It seems that Yama followed the best course of action uh, that was available to him under the circumstances as Savitri condemned him due to the power of austerity. If she was an ordinary woman, she would not have been able to stop Yama from his task. Uh, as a child of light, she radiated through the dark, timeless world of Yama. Under the normal course of action, Yama only takes those people to his world whose life has been exhausted. None is allowed to enter Yama's world, uh, but Savitri is exceptional here. Uh, and Arab Arabindo describes her journey as a search of strength, uh, as well as collapse of time and death. Uh, this is where he actually understood the deeper meaning of the Savitri story uh, as, a, as a journey beyond time. Uh, this travel, unlike any other travel, uh, is beyond time and space and hence beyond death. Uh, this is a travel of the spirit on the path of light. So uh, this is how Sri Aurobindo describes this. Uh, this ignorant life beneath indifferent skies Tied like sacrifice on the altar of time, O oh spirit, immortal energy, if it was to nurse grief in a helpless heart, are with hard tearless eyes await thy doom. Arise, O oh soul, and vanquish time and death. But Savitri's heart replied in the dim night, my strength is taken from me and given to death. Aravinda clearly proposed the limitless uh, limitations of life in the name, matter of time, uh, the path ridden with ignorance. Knowledge overcoming ignorance is overcoming death and the limitations of physical life. It is on this spiritual quest for the higher consciousness, a deathless state, uh, that Savitri meets Satyavan. Uh, she attained this deathless, timeless state. Uh, this is how Sri Aurobindo describes this. Earth must transform herself and equal heaven. Our heaven descends into Earth's mortal state. But for such vast spiritual change to be, out of the mystic cavern in man's heart, the heavenly psyche must put off her veil and step into the common nature crowded rooms and stand uncovered in that nature's front and rule its thoughts and fill the body and life. Obedient to a high command, she said, time, life, and death were passing incidents, obstructing with their transient view of her sight, her sight that must break through and liberate the God imprisoned in the visionless mortal man. So this shows the attainment and uh, he has, he further adds how she uh, reaches this. The shadow of a remote uncaring God doomed to his knot, the illusory in universe, canceling its show of idea and act in time and its limitation, imitation of eternity. She knew that visible death was standing there and Satyavan had passed from her embrace. So she knows this and she uses her uh, uh, yogic power to, uh, to, to reach. So this is, this is how he describes the dialogue between death and uh, 
Savitri. Savitri says this uh, in Aurobindo. Uh, o oh death, I have triumphed over the within. I quiver no more with the assault of grief. A mighty calmness seated deep within has occupied my body and my sense. It takes the world's grief and transmutes it to strength. It makes the world's joy one with the joy of God. My love eternal sits throned on God's calm. For love must soar beyond the very heavens and find its secret sense ineffable. It might change its human ways to ways divine. Yet keep its sovereignty of earthly bliss. O death, not for my heart's sweet poignancy, nor for my happy body's bliss alone, I have claimed from thee the living Satyavan, but, he, but for his work and mine, our sacred charge. So it's, she's clear here about her uh, conscious attainment. And she also uh, informs Yama, it's not for physical bliss or it's not for a happiness of the body that she brought Satyavan back, but it's for the sacred charge of the yogic conscious union that, the, that she uh, mentions here. So Savitri's journey into the depths of darkness and her evolution uh, to a timeless state, claiming the life of Satyavan is explained in metaphorical terms as the journey of the soul through higher states of consciousness, obtaining Manonasa. The Manonasa is the um, uh, highest stage in uh, integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo. So the, so the uh, deeper meaning comes out in, uh, in the um, descriptions of uh, Aurobindo. Uh, as she comes back, she informs her parents-in-law and uh, Satyavan uh, suddenly does not understand what's going on. Um, so, uh, so he asks her what is going on and I saw this black man and I don't understand and how be it became so dark and uh, so quickly. Uh, so she tries to uh, dissuade him from these questions uh, and uh, he doesn't want to stay here. So. Uh, both of them uh, start uh, and uh, go back to their um, ashrama. Uh, at the ashrama, the parents-in-law as well as uh, the sages ask her what happened and she informs them um, the, what happened and all the boons. Uh, and and um, as they inform them, uh, it was uh, late in the, like, past midnight, so they all uh, retire to their ashramas and sleep. Uh, but uh, uh, Savitri's um, boons come, uh, come through the next day right away. Um, the, the ministers of uh, counselors and ministers of her father-in-law uh, visit the ashram the next day uh, and tell him that uh, the one who made them leave their kingdom uh, had died uh, and they wanted to bring uh, bring them back to the kingdom as king. So, uh, so Savitri, her husband and her family proceed. This is the last part, last fifth part of her journey. Uh, and they proceed and uh, her father-in-law actually um, nominates uh, the son uh, as the king uh, and she becomes the queen. Uh, and so the story ends here. So realizing the higher states of mind, uh, conquering the time, and then returning to the earth to, to be a great queen uh, is, is an important part of her story. Uh, Savitri is a courageous feminine hero. She ventured on her quest to find love, life, and success through her veracity and unwavering commitment to her chosen path. Naturally, her story remains the inspiration for millions of women who celebrates her festival every year, symbolically performing the ritual that brings her memory to life. On a symbolic level, Savitri's journey is indicative of the spiritual journey, which is noted in Aurobindo's composition, Savitri. The deep meaning of Savitri's journey on the human level as well as on the spiritual level is not discernible at the first glance, but deeply embedded in the symbolic descriptions. Uh, Savitri's immense meaning is not understood fully as previous depictions, previous works, uh, scholarship, uh, focused on understanding her, her as a loyal wife uh, are um, a strong heroine, uh, but not, not the deeper meaning. 
uh, journeys into the woods and then into the other worlds, none other than the world of uh, death uh, is, a, is an immense feat. The meditative state of perfect consciousness beyond time and death uh, is attained by Savitri, uh, which let her bring back the life uh, and prosperity. The festival celebrated uh, remembers this. So uh, Savitri is a unique uh, traveler and a unique divine feminine uh, in um, Indian uh, story literature. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I will stop here. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lavanya, for this very interesting talk on uh, uh, Savitri. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, the wonderful analysis that you have done, uh, taking the help of uh, uh, the reading of uh, Arabindo mm -hmm. you know, of uh, Savitri. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really very helpful to us uh, because of two reasons, you know, something that is related to the project straight away. Uh, like you have related it uh, to yoga and also the uh, levels of consciousness, higher states of consciousness that she tries to reach, you know, which are also uh, the uh, some of the aims of the project that we have uh, taken up. So that is how it is very much uh, uh, relevant to the theme and also uh, very informative as well. Thank you so much for that. And also the analysis that you have done beyond the history, taking it into philosophy, taking it to yoga and taking it to uh, spirituality and uh, talking about uh, higher levels of consciousness and relating it to uh, how uh, the practices that Savitri has performed during the time of uh, uh, you know, that one year uh, helped her in reaching uh, a stage of yoga, which helped her to even converse with uh, uh, Yama. And the story itself, you know, Savitri's story, as you are rightly pointing out, there are two uh, interpretations. One is the traditional interpretation where the uh, she was only looked at as a devoted wife and then uh, she fights for her husband and brings her brings him back to life uh, but the modern interpretation which was uh, uh, spearheaded by uh, arubindo where uh, it is it is more analytical and creative kind of one which is uh, in tune with his conception of integral yoga that is very important and it is it has come out really well in your presentation of uh, a five-part presentation of uh, uh, Savitri's uh, uh, journey, journey from journey beyond death and beyond time. You know? <laughs> that's that's uh, that's the key, you know, uh, the hitting point. So thank you so much for this wonderful uh, analytical explanation that you have given uh, to us uh, through your lecture. Uh, with your permission, uh, I would uh, read out some of the questions uh, so that we can have a further conversation. Right? Is that okay? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first, one of the questions that I see here uh, is, uh, do you think that women of uh, Savitri's spiritual excellence did not get the recognition uh, as she actually deserved by the scholars working on the epic? Uh, if yes, then what must have been the reason? Now, would you like to respond to that? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> Mahabharata is not um, not analyzed from an Indian viewpoint and Indian philosophical context. Uh, Professor Bala would know more <laughs> because he is in the philosophy uh, and I'm in history and uh, religious studies. <clears throat> from a religious studies viewpoint, I can say uh, the Hinduism hasn't uh, received full attention uh, to the deeper aspects of the study. Mahabharata studies, there were a lot of studies that were done, um, but um, I would say they, they were done well, but some somewhat incomplete uh, in understanding the real meaning uh, of the act, actual stories, actual contextualization, actual philosophical depictions. Um, uh, this is because um, Indians understood, but uh, Indians have been kept away uh, from these studies and texts for a long time um, because of long colonization uh, and the colonial works, uh, colonial scholarship uh, understood it from a different uh, worldview and different uh, point of view. Uh, so colonization has affected uh, all the academic studies on in India. Um, so. 
that is one point and the second point is um none none of us have actually paid uh, much attention to yoga integral yoga and uh, conscious uh, and the states of mind um the states of mind and the discussions on the mind and consciousness is not fully studied still Uh, so we we have to explore uh, we have to go uh, in deeper and study our classical texts as well as our sacred texts um it is still missing uh, from the larger academic debate so so i i would find these two reasons uh, for for this but um, there 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 might be more reasons right <laughs> not one or two but uh, these two are the main reasons Uh, the colonial perspectives colonization of uh, academia uh, and the secondly that you know we were mute and we were kept away from studying it and we haven't uh, yet studied the deeper meaning so yeah yeah so we we are beginning so which is a good sign <laughs> yeah uh, that's nice thank you so much for that response in fact it is true that uh, uh, a proper uh, yeah there, there is a lacuna with regard to uh, approaching uh, uh, mahabharata or Uh, the other epic as well ramayana from indian philosophical perspective and trying to bring it to the scholarly debate that is happening in the academia so this is where uh, there is a lacuna and the reasons that you have pointed out in terms of colonization and the other one is like mutedness self mutedness of uh, indian academia because from our side we think that we yeah, we know it so why should we write about it <laughs> the kind of attitude that uh, some of uh, how people would have is that yeah i know that this is this is how it has to be looked at so why should i say it it's it's it, there is no need but the western yes. scholarship says it and that's how they get the predominance of uh, being read no only if you write the, it would be read and we since we think that we are we, we know it uh, we don't feel like writing it no it's it, it looks to be a redundant kind of thing for indian uh, person so right. that uh, one of the things thank you so much for pointing out that and i'll go to the second uh, question that i see here it's more related to arvindo since you you are reading arvindo's uh, rendition yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we learn from arvindo's uh, evolution and uh, involution from savitri's story uh, because uh, arvindo talks about uh, uh, specific stages no of evolution yeah. so fire yeah. mind illumined mind and over mind so mm-hmm. do you see uh, the relation between savitri's story and that in fact you touched upon this aspect during your talk please right yes um, savitri is a deeper text uh, shri arbindo has done a great um, he has attained the enlightened yoga state status so uh, the integral yoga and mananasa um, so he tries to bring um, the the meaning embedded in the story through his inner conscious through his inner eye so uh, the the deeper meaning is embedded in the book uh, and i talked about the three stages of uh, savitri's uh, journey here uh, but it is even more deeper and even uh, more deeply explained uh, in the text by shri arabindo um it, it, it's for us to read uh, and uh, understand it um for for the three stages that i see here are um, the path on the journey of conquering the time and uh, the, the the life and death so um once one realizes this higher consciousness there is no time and no death no consciousness of this physical world there is only higher consciousness that's what uh, shri arbindo is showing here um i i i would be focusing more on analyzing this in a separate work uh, because he has actually given five stages i discussed uh, three stages here hmm. um it needs a separate work uh, on actually understanding the deeper meaning of integral yoga uh, embedded in the savitri of shri arbindo Oh, it, it has much more deeper meaning than uh, these three stages. Yes. Yeah, we would be looking forward to reading your other work as well. Then <laughs> we will wait for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, actually, somebody is asking, like, what exactly is this timeless journey that you are talking about uh, of Savitri? You explained it in terms of uh, timelessness means going beyond death. So that's how you explained. So uh, would you like to respond to that again? Yeah the the time um 
time is a concept, uh, an important concept. Uh, and the Vedas, uh, as well as Upanishads, as well as the um, works of Aurobindo, um, all our yoga works actually focus on this. The, the, the evolution of mind uh, is actually going beyond time. So going beyond time is going beyond time and space. So, so, so the concept of time is very important. Uh, we are talking about physical world in terms of time. You know, the revolutions that earth takes around sun and the um, revolutions that we actually live for uh, within these revolutions. But going beyond this cycle of time uh, is actually attaining this higher consciousness. So time, going beyond time uh, is, is important aspect of yoga. Uh, attaining uh, consciousness, integral consciousness. So, so the concept of time uh, in three different aspects is also discussed in the Vedas and uh, in the yoga um, texts. Um, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the time, the concept of time that, that's, that's with space and uh, the travel of spirit beyond this point as well as the physical time, the physical time of earth and the physical time of universe. The universe has a different concept of time, right? You know, the Brahma's year, physical human year and all that. So, the, so, so Hinduism discusses all these things very deeply. The, the higher universal time, uh, as well as the physical time of humans. And when we attain yogic state, the mind actually can travel beyond these time limitations. The, the universal time, as well as the human time. It enters into a different state of time. That's what we call a timeless state. So, so it, it crosses the physical limitations of the universal time, as well as the human time. Yeah. The, the yoga consciousness is a different state of mind. Great. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, what we find in uh, Mahabharata is... Uh, multi-layered, you know, time is multi-layered and there is one eternal time which is Mahakala. In fact, that's what narrates the story of uh, Mahabharata. That's the Shunya, that's the Shunya. The Mahakala, the, 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 the concept of Kala, Shiva as the Mahakala is the Shunya. There, there is no time there, but everywhere else there is time. That's why the Ujjain temple is the zero um, meridian for India because it's, it represents the zero of yeah. this time cycle. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, yeah, there is another question that I see, uh, which is related to uh, uh, your study as well. Like, as you also give a feminist perspective, apart from spiritual evolution and devotion, what can the women learn from the story of Savitri, <laughs> according to you? Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think it's ju not just for women. Uh, it's also for men. Uh, it's a deeper, deeper story. Uh, but just because it is a women's story, it was relegated to the background as a women's story, you know, as a devoted wife and a courageous woman, that's about it. <laughs> but the meaning is much more deeper than that. Uh, the central pillars of her story is this spiritual journey and going beyond time uh, that we miss uh, because we, we, we consider it just as a women's story. Uh, but it's not just a woman's story. It's a story of uh, immense journey. Uh, and if we focus on the yoga and the consciousness as uh, Sri Aurobindo has brought out, uh, we would really understand the actual meaning of the story uh, and actual, uh, actual understanding of controlling your mind to attain what you want. Anybody can focus their mind to what they want. Uh, Savitri focused and Savitri practiced these mindful meditation and mindful activities for the whole year and ending it with this big yoga practice in the end that you know you can actually make your mind do, do the things that you want is an is a immense spiritual consequence for anyone, um, not just women, for, for men and uh, anyone. It's, it's an inspirational story. Uh, and that's what I mentioned, you know, such an inspirational story and it's relegated to the background as, as a simple woman's story, so, you know, sati, that's it, you know, not, not really the actual meaning. We, we lost actual meaning of many of our stories um, and history of many of our stories. 
uh, Savitri story, of course, it shows this yoga and the immense powers of this, how, how you can mold your mind and all that. At the same time, it also in, includes the history. Our history of practicing yoga and incorporating it into our life and how our life is lived uh, with a yoga consciousness, uh, probably three millennia or five millennia ago. So, so we have forgotten our history. We have forgotten our uh, practices, uh, which has, of course, you know, <laughs> and we, we're going back to, you know, it has muted us. So we have to open uh, the, the vision of the eye um, in, the, in the mind. So, yeah. so it has immense meaning, not just women's story. It's an inspirational story for anyone. Right, great, thank you. Yeah, that's how I make a distinction between memory and knowledge. We left it or we kept the tradition only in the form of memory, but we have to keep it in the form of knowledge. Only then you would start using it in your life. If, if it is a mere memory, then uh, you, you consider it to be something that is dead and it is still there. It's good. It's there, I remember, but it's not useful to the, uh, the present times. This is how we look at it. Uh, yeah, there is another interesting question uh, that we have, uh, uh, Dr. Lavanya. Uh, Pre-independence, during colonial rule, many films and plays have been made and written on Satyavan and Savitri, but not today. Rather, it is considered a, reg a, considered a regressive subject now. What do you think could be the reason behind that? No, it, It's true. See, yeah, the, nothing much is coming up on uh, uh, the same story in the present time. So what could be the reason? Can you guess? Because you have <laughs> the story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have mentioned in the, so one is, you know, merely treating it as a, as a trope, women's story, huh? why do we care? Uh, and the second thing is colonized mind. Uh, we were colonized, we were muted out, uh, and we don't know the true meaning of our work and our literature and our classics. So we're still, still in this muted state. We are coming out, but, um, uh, and we were also taught. Um, all these are, you know, not good practices. Uh, doing yoga, doing fasting, doing all these things is, you know, regressive, you know, backward. <laughs> so, uh, so naturally, uh, it, the stories are there, but gradually uh, lost its meaning, lost its immense, uh, immense value. Uh, this story brings immense value, actually, to understand the human conscious, but we lost that meaning, we lost the practice that's associated with it, and we lost the yoga, um, the yoga uh, also for women as well as men. Uh, even women staying at home, she was staying at home and practicing these uh, yoga practices. So Mahabharata depicts many women practicing yoga. Uh, so, uh, mm. so the idea that women were kept away from knowledge, not given uh, real practice of anything is, uh, not you know so so uh, it, it it is gradual I would say but uh, I would blame it on the colonized mind <laughs> we were oh. colonized and taught for a long time to uh, consider uh, everything Indian as backward yeah 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 this teaching is not uh, in the past it's still in the present <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> it's thought that way <laughs> colonized mind. <laughs> We have to take our mind into higher conscious. <laughs> right. You, you gave a presentation in uh, Dr. Pankaj Zain's uh, talk on decolonizing mind, right? So, <laughs> right, right. Decolonizing mind is important. Then we can come across and find our own self. Just like right. Savitri, we have to find our own self. We have to travel into this deeper forest that is dark and that is difficult to travel. Uh, and then we have to realize ourselves and then we'll come out and find the light and you know we can do anything yeah yeah so uh, there is one more question uh, like can the evolving consciousness as achieved by savitri achievable in today's world do you think it's possible in today's world it, it's possible that sri arabindo has told us that from his own practice and his own experience so this is our 19th century example for us. Uh, of course, Mahabharata tells us that uh, any man, any woman can do what they want to do. So, and uh, a man and a woman are, are uh, others. Uh, they can 
set their mind and they can achieve their goals. Uh, Mahabharata, the, the, uh, the actual concept uh, in the Mahabharata is that. Uh, and of course, our yogis uh, in the 19th century have, have also shown us. So, yeah. so th there is a possibility. We can all attain the higher conscious. Doesn't matter who we are, we can all do it. In fact, uh, this is uh, this uh, story is a wonderful example of how uh, what kind of ethical philosophical take that we can take from Mahabharata, you know? right. uh, because it, it talks about ethics and it, it gives a wonderful philosophical deeper meaning of uh, the life as such. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thanks thanks a lot, uh, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Lavanya, for uh, responding to all the questions. And in fact, uh, uh, friends, uh, as she was pointing out. Um, there are only two encounters that humans had with death of God, Emma, in our mythology. And in one encounter, there is no dialogue at all. And this being the only other uh, encounter where there is a dialogue. And finally, the humans win. <laughs> so that's, that's the most important right. thing. That is uh, immense important, right? <laughs> that is immense important. And... Uh, uh, definitely such kind of a story, if it is posited somewhere, which means it is posited for a specific reason so that we can derive deeper meanings from it and learn lessons for ourselves as well. Now, another important aspect that I want to uh, mention here is a metaphor of a forest. Now, forests were always presented as a, a, a metaphor for self-journey and also knowledge acquisition, storehouses of knowledge. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Dharmaraja and others go to the forest, Pandavas go to the forest, and then they meet the people and try to learn from the people. Okay, And whenever there is a problem, people go to forest and try to get back, come back with the solution. So forest as a metaphor for knowledge house is uh, uh, very well depicted in this uh, text again and again in various stories and various uh, uh, standards. So it's, it's wonderful uh, listening to you, uh, Dr. Lavanya. Thank you so much for sparing your time and giving us uh, uh, your insights on it. Now I hand over uh, the program to Dr. Geetesh to take things further. Over to you, Dr. Geetesh. Thank you, Professor Bala. And thank you, uh, Professor Lavanya. It's through her scholarly presentation that she put forth before us how Savitri as a character discovered her path to her spiritual quest. In fact, the woman protagonist in the epic, the meaning of whose life was not just of a devoted wife, but also of someone who mastered the yogic strength to have a dialogue with death too. And that really makes her stand out in the epic. And yes, it is whatever reasons for whatever reasons, she's not been given the kind of weightage as she should have been. So starting through the path of history, Professor Lavanya brought forth the philosophical interpretation of the story of the Savitri through the work of Sri Aurobindo with focus on yoga consciousness, which actually, as Professor Bala said, is a central theme of our ongoing project. So Professor Lavanya, thank you for touching upon the whole element of yoga consciousness, because that's what we all are working on too. And yes, as the message comes out absolutely clearly that we need to reread the stories of the epic with deeper reflection to understand not just the content of the epic, but its immense value, which is inherent in these stories of the epic. Professor Lavanya, we are really grateful to you for having spared this time to bring these key elements uh, and present and the way you presented it before our participants. I think it's a real encouragement for quite a lot of younger scholars. On behalf of the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi, Kamla Nehru College, University of Delhi, and the whole team spark, which consists of Professor Bala, our researchers abroad, our researchers in India, and myself, I really thank you for being with us, for sparing time early in the morning for us. We are here in the evening, you are there in the morning. And I would like to uh, say special thanks to our participants who always encourage us through their consistent presence 
presence in all the webinars on our various social media handles. Here and I even make a request to all the participants to follow our social media handles, as well as share them with your friends, as well as in other communities, because the whole project is basically to get into building process a newer community of Mahabharat learning. Thank you all. I now request you all to switch on your videos so that we can see each other and have quick screenshots for our records. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bala, and thank you, Geetish Ji. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I'll quickly take uh, screenshots for our records. Request all of you to wear a smile. Teach. You were there at HCU, Hyderabad Central University, right? There? I got my history PhD from there. Oh, what what was the time uh, period? Um, ancient history. No, I'm I'm talking about when were when were you there at HCU? Uh, ninety three to ninety eight. Oh, that's surprising. I was there uh, during ninety three to two thousand. I've done my oh. master's as well as PhD from there. Oh, okay. You might have crisscrossed each other's path. Right, we might have, but <laughs> we're meeting here today. Right. Thank you, thank you, Professor Lavanya, for being with us. Thank you, thank you, Spark, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.